So with deep listening, there's a quality of presence where there isn't a lot of selfing, a lot of activity of interpreting, judging, reading into, preparing. There's just openness and receptivity. There's no controlling of anything. But as you know, uh, it's rare that we are listening in that kind of an openness. There's a lot of static usually because we're somewhat in a trance where we're projecting you know, what we think is being said and where we think it's going to go and we're being influenced by our wants and our fears about the conversation. So what I'd like to do is just let's, let's move in a little closer to what goes on when we are in conversation but our listening is somewhat blocked. And if you break it down to wants and fears, when we're in communication and we're not conscious of it, there's a whole uh, layer of wanting that creates static. And you might think of even, you know, just scan a recent, for recent conversation with somebody. You might have something in mind where you just spent five, ten minutes with somebody and just notice, were there wants there? Did you want that person to experience you in a certain way? That's one of the basic wants we have usually when we're talking. Did you want that person's approval? Did you want the conversation to go in a particular direction? Did you want to prove something? Did you want to fix the person or accomplish something? Do you see what I mean? There's, there's all these layers of wants we, that are usually there. And the truth is, and it's just like any other spiritual practice, that if there's a goal, if we're striving for something to happen, to make an impression, to have something go our way, to persuade, whatever, that striving interferes with presence, with really recognizing and hearing what's truly there. Some of you might remember the story of a student entering a monastery and he's really eager to experience enlightenment and he asks the abbot, you know, how long will it take me, you know, to experience like total satori? And uh, the, the abbot says, 10 years. And then the guy says, well, what if I work really, really hard? <laughs> and the, the abbot says, 20 years. Hey, wait a minute, you just said 10 years. For you, 30 years. <laughs> But you get the idea that if we're in a conversation and we're trying to make something happen, uh, that gets between us and listening with an awake heart. And it's the same thing as when there's aversion. Aversion is the flip side of wanting. What happens when you're with somebody and you're talking and there's aversion because they're making you feel insecure about yourself? They make you feel like you're being judged or criticized. I mean, how many have had that experience of your partner saying to you, these are magic four words, we need to talk? What happens? You get tight. Are you really going to listen? It's hard to listen when we feel hurt or offended, when we feel pushed away by what another is saying. We, we, we shut down. It's hard to listen when we feel insecure about having the right response. We want to sound intelligent or like we know what's going on. Then, it, then we get tight. It's hard to listen when the other person's not connected with themselves and they're speaking, when they're not speaking from realness or we get distracted. You know, we get pulled all around by this complex mix of what we're wanting to happen and what we're not wanting to happen. So, and just to say that sometimes the wanting and the aversion doesn't have anything to do with the other person. Sometimes we're in a conversation and we're not listening because we really want to go and get something else done or get some food or be talking to somebody different. Or we're in a conversation and it's, our aversion's not to do with that person. What's going on in that moment is that uh, we feel like we don't have enough time. How many of you have experienced that? You just can't quite listen because I don't have enough time. I feel that so often. So I thought I'd share with you a story that uh, really impacted me on this front. I've, I've mentioned here a number of times a book I love called Tattoos on the Heart. This is Gregory Boyle. 
So Gregory Boyle's a Jesuit priest who works with gangs in Los Angeles, the, in the most the most violent parts of Los Angeles. And uh, he'd create work programs for them and a whole lot, a sense of community, a very a huge amount of healing he's been responsible for. So he describes one morning that he's completed mass and the next thing he has is a, a baptism to do. So he's got a little time between the two. So he goes into his office. He's got like about 10 minutes. And a few minutes in, a woman walks into the, the room and her name's Carmen. And she's a heroin addict, a gang member, occasional prostitute. She, he says she's often seen defiantly storming down the street, usually shouting at someone. So she seats herself and, and jumps right in. And he's got seven minutes, and so this is what he describes. I need help. She launches right in brash and something of a no shit sister. Oh, she says, I've been to like 50 rehabs. I'm known all over, nationwide. She smiles. Her eyes wander around my office, and she studies all the photographs hanging there. She multitasks, and her inspection of the place doesn't derail her stream of consciousness rambling. The family will arrive for the baptism in a few minutes. I went to Catholic church all my life, she says. Fact, I graduated from high school even. Fact, right after graduation is when I started to use heroin. Carmen enters some kind of trance at this point, and her speech slows to deliberate and halting. And I have been trying to stop since the moment I began. Then I watch as Carmen tilts her head back until it meets the wall. She stares at the ceiling, and in an instant her eyes become these two ponds, water rising to meet their edges, swollen banks spilling over. Then, for the first time, really, she looks at me and straightens. I am a disgrace. Suddenly her shame meets mine, for when Carmen walked through the door, I had mistaken her for an interruption. So you understand that when we have that, that mantra of, I don't have enough time, what happens to anything that comes up? It becomes an object out there that's in our way. What happens to listening? We're not there for it. I want to name one more most basic level of fear that interferes with listening. And I alluded to it, and that's the fear of not being here. That rather than listen, because listening requires really letting go of our self-agenda, really kind of emptying out um, we're preparing to reassert that I'm here. It's like that, that desire we keep having to say, I'm here, I exist. We keep having to put our existence out there. And uh, listening's the opposite. It's almost like saying, okay, let it go. Make space for whatever is coming through. So we're preparing, we're uncomfortable, and we don't know who we are when we're not planning our response. There's a strong tendency to want to assert a self who knows somebody. This is, this is the fundamental self-sense, holding on to itself. This is why listening is so profound, that when we really begin this practice, it goes right to the heart of a, liber- of a path of liberation. It's no different than when we're just sitting and practicing and listening to what's going on inside us. It requires putting down our evaluations of what we're experiencing, our judgments, our interpretations, which means we're putting down our self-sense and just letting life be as it is, liberating and challenging. So the key to this uh, very sacred art of listening is to not control or direct what's going on not to pursue our wants, not to avoid our fears, to recognize what's going on inside us, but to stay. And we're not trying to control another person. Here's my, pretty much my favorite description. This is Mark Nepo. To listen 
is to lean in softly with a willingness to be changed by what we hear. To listen is to lean in softly with a willingness to be changed by what we hear. Take a moment, if you will, just to pause and close your eyes and perhaps bring to mind one person that you'd like to deepen your capacity for listening with. You might bring to mind a recent occasion of conversing and without judging yourself, just to notice. If you were asking the question, well, what's between me and listening with an awake heart? What might have been stopping you? Was there an agenda where you wanted something? Maybe approval or cooperation or their understanding? Was there aversion in some way? Some fear of judgment? A feeling of not enough time? How did you control the experience if you weren't just simply listening? Did you get distracted into your own thoughts? Do you try to steer the conversation, plan a response? Imagine for a moment if you are redoing, what would your intention be? How would you sense your own intention around listening? Just using your own words, what do you wish? To listen is to lean in softly with a willingness to be changed by what we hear. the willingness to discover, to understand more deeply. Yeah, so when you're ready, feel free to open your eyes. So the gift of this path of really deliberately deepening our capacity for listening is that we spend more moments, we're resting in our true nature, in a full awareness that's that's not centralized around self, that's open, sensitive, engaged. Um, And for the other, it creates an atmosphere of love. In listening, offering our presence is the deepest expression of love. It's such an invitation for another person. It makes it safe for the other person to unfold and to blossom. And when somebody listens to us without judgment, with that openness and that sensitivity, we unfold in that presence. One of my favorite descriptions of the power of listening is to imagine that our essence, this creative spirit that all of us have, is like a fountain. And that... Uh, it's the source of the fountain. It's for all of us, that same pure awareness, intelligence, love. It's all the same for all of us. But when we haven't been listened to, that creative source, that fountain, kind of dries. It shrivels. It's like when it's listened to, it thrives. It, it really flows. So, but, but when we haven't been listened to, and when we don't listen to ourselves, kind of dries up and it gets clogged. And then 
what we express is kind of murky or vague or confused. Sometimes you'll talk to people or you'll find yourself speaking in a way where you're really speedy or nervous and there's no silences and there's no real connection with what's there. And that's because you haven't had that much of that atmosphere of real listening presence given to you or given to you or you haven't given it to yourself. So it happens for a lot of us and sometimes all that will come out when there's that clogged upness, when we haven't really been listened to or when we don't listen to ourselves, all that will come up out is more superficial talk, kind of nervous prepackaged stuff. I think we all know about that. We know when we're in that state, when we're stressed and not in touch with ourselves and we can sense it for others. Those are the times when instead of being connected, there's we're kind of hijacked by the part of us that's wanting to prove or protect or defend. And so we're living from externals, really what's expected, what we should be saying, not communing from the depths. So listening, when we offer that to each other, is it invites that, that creative fountain to begin to flow again. It offers a space for inner truth to, to unfold itself and really shine through. But just to say, it takes patience, both offering listening inward and to others, because sometimes initially there's kind of muddy waters, and, and we need to kind of include that and give space for that so something pure and clear come forth. Does that make sense, that it would take time? It's an amazing gift that we can offer, even just a little bit, even with somebody that we don't know we're not going to spend much time with, just offering that space, something begins to happen. This is Thich Nhat Hanh. He says, deep listening is the kind of listening that can help relieve the suffering of another person. You can call it compassionate listening. You listen with only one purpose, to help him or her to empty his heart. Even if he says things that are full of wrong perceptions, full of bitterness, you're still capable of continuing to listen with compassion. You just listen with compassion and help him to suffer less. One hour like that can bring transformation and healing. So what are the basics in this training? It's really the same as when we meditate. Uh, We set our intention. Okay, when I go back home and I'm with my partner or with my teenage son or with my father or whatever it is, um, I plan to listen, to really see if I can let go of all the interrupting static and just be there. And then it's very helpful to have an anchor, to have something to keep coming back to your physical sensations in your body, or um, your breath, something just to say, I'm here, I'm here. And a commitment to being willing to notice whatever the resistances are. So as you're listening, you notice you're judging, or as you're listening, you're noticing unpleasantness and not wanting to be there. So part of you just names it and forgives it. It's okay. You have to be open to recognizing what's going on inside you, or you can't truly be listening to another. And then I find the self-coaching is, it's a really brilliant approach if there's sometimes a, just a few words that you remind yourself of. Like sometimes I'll just say there's plenty of time, even if I don't believe it. <laughs> really, just saying it because some deep part of me knows it's true. You know, my neurotic egoic self that wants to always get more done doesn't believe it, but there's a deeper place that knows that if I can really pause, that there's some timeless presence there, that that's where everything that I cherish is possible. And I'm really pausing when the ideas of a future and a past just start dissolving. 